Hello, and uh, thanks for joining. Uh, so this talk is about, uh, well, serverless and power. So we're, um, we were kind of curious to see, you know, is serverless actually powerless? You know, like if you scale it down to zero, does it not use energy? So we're going to find out in this talk exactly uh, how that works and uh, how we came to some interesting conclusions. Uh, so my name is uh, Kevin Dubois. I'm a developer advocate at, uh, at Red Hat. Uh, I'm based in Belgium, so I didn't have to travel too far today. Um, and uh, I also speak some uh, English, Dutch, French, and Italian. So if you have questions afterwards, uh, I can talk to you in those languages. Um, and I'm a really big fan of open source, of course. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, and I'm Jose gomez -Selles. Um, I work as a product manager at Red Hat, um, mostly in observability uh, for products like open telemetry, distributed tracing, and Kepler. Uh, we will be discussing a bit on those, some of them. Uh, I'm based in Madrid, in Spain. And uh, despite what the White House is saying these days, I love programming in C++. And also love, uh, I've been playing heavy metal for quite a long. I should be better, actually. Um, and sim racing. So if you want to talk about those things afterwards, I'd be very happy to. Um, so I did a PhD in materials engineering for which we were trying to find new materials for, um, uh, to find new semiconductors to perform better so we can make better transistors so they get more efficient. This was like 10 years ago. And what, uh, trying to find some material for this talk, I found that I failed miserably, and everybody's failing. And you might think, well, this is uh, a talk that you can check later. We will upload these slides, and uh, very clever people, you know, IBM, MIT, Google. Um, whether you think this is important or not, doesn't really matter, because the rate that we are producing more energy and noise lately, um, is higher than the capacity we have. So this is happening, guys. The good thing, if there's a good thing, is that we are not alone, right? If you care about the planet, if you care about, any, uh, about anything related to sustainability, there is someone that can be an ally that is someone who doesn't want to spend more money. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing, right? We see, uh, on the one hand, we care, of course, about the planet. I think most of us do, uh, hopefully. Um, and our CFO, he might also care about the planet, but he also likes to look at, you know, what are uh, some of the financial uh, factors into all of this. So the CNCF did an interesting um, interview in uh, December, and uh, they were asking, you know, what factors are leading you to overspend? And we can see that there's, uh, there's quite a few that kind of uh, uh, have a relation with, uh, with the power usage, with the actual resource usage of your applications, right? So you can see that 70% are reporting that they're over-provisioning, that uh, they're using more resources than necessary. Um, and then you can also see, like, 43% says that uh, um, resources are not deactivated after use, or they're just sitting there uh, wasting energy. Um, and then fluctuating consumption demands and poor planning and prediction on cloud consumption. And those are all factors uh, that, of course, affect not only you know, the pocketbook of, uh, of your organization, but those things are sitting there consuming resources and, uh, and energy, right? So um, if we take a look at you know, how our traditional deployments work, uh, you know, we'll over-provision, right? Because we want to make sure that when there's load coming in, uh, that we can handle it, right? And then so you can see that most of the time, we're actually having too many resources. We're spending more money and more energy than we should. And then still, we run the risk that at some point, we get, you know, ideally, we get a lot of requests to our systems, and we have happy users. But if we get too many requests, that we end up in an under-provisioned state, uh, even though we try to you know, be safe and, and over-provision. Um, so that's not so ideal, right? So uh, what would be better if we can scale based on the demand of the moment um, and use only what you need, right? So you can do that uh, more or less with uh, you know, like regular, let's say, Kubernetes. 
um, with horizontal pod auto scaling and stuff like that. Um, but with serverless, you can actually scale all the way down to zero, right? So if there's no request coming in, you have no pods running, you use no, uh, well, we would assume that you're not using any power, but that's what we, wanna, what we wanted to find out. Um, so a project that does this in the, in the CNCF landscape that works with Kubernetes is, uh, is Knative, right? So Knative enables uh, serverless on Kubernetes. It uh, provides out-of-the-box auto-scaling to zero. So uh, it basically looks for requests coming in. If there's no requests coming in, then it'll you know, scale your pods to zero. And if there's a lot of requests coming in, it's going to scale it up. And it can be very flexible with, uh, with the scaling, which is pretty cool. Um, and Knative is not just about auto-scaling, right? It has a bunch of different features like eventing and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and logic and stuff like that. It has this built-in load balancer as well to make sure that you know, all your pods are uh, using the resources uh, efficiently. And the idea with serverless, of course, out, uh, outside of the scaling itself, is that your server complexity gets abstracted away, right? That's kind of where that name serverless came from. It's not that there's no servers. We always have to mention that when we're talking about serverless. Um, and so you would think, right, auto scale to zero, that means there's no power usage, right? This makes sense. I mean, if there's no pods, then how are they uh, using energy, right? Well, of course, there's a little bit more to it, right? So we have the pods themselves, but they need to be scaled up and down based on the demand that's coming in. And like I said, that happens based on uh, the requests coming in. It's, uh, you know, your usual Kubernetes auto-scaling happens based on CPU and memory. Um, but that means that there needs to be a pod running to collect the usage, right, the CPU and memory. Um, and so with Knative, it's kind of an inverse situation. It does not look necessarily at CPU and memory. It looks at requests. But so you need some way to know that requests are coming in or not. So the way that this happens in Kubernetes, basically, there's a control plane. So you have traffic coming in. It goes through an HTTP router. And it's going to send traffic uh, by default to this activator, which is going to notice, like, oh, there's traffic. So we need to auto scale. We need to scale our application up or down. And then uh, if there's a lot of requests coming in, it also has this burst feature, uh, in which case it's going to send traffic directly to the pod and, and skip the activator to you know, uh, increase the performance. And there's this uh, queue proxy sidecar container inside the pod that uh, will also report back to the auto scaler then to you know, determine whether it needs to scale or not. But so, of course, there's a little bit of overhead to this, right? So it's not just the pods that we need to look at. It's the, you know, the, the whole Knative uh, control plane. So um, that's uh, what we wanted to measure. So you know, because we can guess that the pods are not using anything, and maybe what is the control plane using? Yeah, and if we only had a tool, right, uh, to do that, how many of you uh, know Kepler? Don't be shy. OK. It's not I would lot. say like 10%. Yeah, we need to. So actually, there is a booth uh, there for the community. Please pass by. They are very nice people. Um, so Kepler is a great acronym, actually. Um, and it stands for Kubernetes-Based Efficient Power Level Exporter. But let me um, explain to you about, uh, uh, or give you some introduction to it. Uh, the cool thing about it is that it's able to, for the first time, give you uh, low, like granular power consumption metrics. So it's able to tell you how much energy and power your pods, namespaces, nodes are spending. So you can take a look at, aha, uh -huh, this guy is spending a lot, right? Um, it uses eBPF and Rappel. Uh, I will get that, uh, get into that in a second. And uh, just for you to know, it was accepted as a sandbox project um, just a year ago, right? So we are, we will be celebrating next month. Um, so how does it work under the hood? Just a few notes. This is much more complex, but I try to make something um, easy. You know, I am a product manager, so. Um, so every time you uh, want to tell your CPU, to put this example, to do something, you will end up calling the kernel, which will end up calling the hardware itself. So what Kepler does, it installs a program 
that hooks into the scheduler and says, hey, every time you finish a task, let me know, right? It will do it asynchronously, but it takes note. So what it can do now is say, aha, uh -huh. so it was you with this, you with this uh, ID, cool, and you were spending this many CPU cycles, okay, and you did this catch misses, not that good, okay, and takes note. Okay, so please store this one uh, in your brain for a second, and, and let's put it back. So we had eBPF doing that thing, okay? Now let's talk about uh, Rappel. Rappel enters the chat. And um, what it does is that it's able to, we are in Linux, so yeah, it's in a file, right? It's not that fancy. This, the, the technology is fancy itself. Uh, but then uh, you, you will have available the amount of energy that is coming from different components, so CPU, um, uh, RAM, other anchor components, um, and, uh, and so forth. So we have these two things, right? So clever people thought, hey, let's try to make a ratio, because I know that this guy is spending these many cycles. I know all the energy that was spent, so I can do a ratio. So this 20% of this energy is because of you. And then we can point fingers, which we love. Um, so then we love modern uh, uh, observability, so we put them in Prometheus. The end of the day, what you will be doing is uh, you install Kepler. Kepler will install this program uh, into the kernel, the eBPF program. And then every time you call uh, to do your fancy servers and, and Kubernetes stuff, uh, uh, Kepler will be uh, knowing, Kepler will be watching you. And then uh, you will be able to see it in the uh, in a cool dashboard, right? So, uh, but then okay, th this was a lot of theory. Sorry for that. There won't be more. Uh, we were wondering, right? Like, is serverless power powerfully powerless or not? Yeah, exactly. It's funny. We we were uh, kind of rehearsing this talk before. <laughs> this uh, power powerfully powerless is quite a tongue twister. So <laughs> I, I like that you were the first one to trip over it. Um, so. Okay, so we created uh, a different scenarios to test, right? To see, you know, how, how uh, what is the power usage of applications using both serverless and non-serverless, and we were thinking, like, okay, how can we do this in a in a fair way? Because um, Knative also has a load balancer, and um, so we were thinking, like, okay, well, so it would be fair that the uh, the application, the the server full, right, the non-serverless application. Uh, would use kind of a similar system. So we're thinking, you know, maybe with uh, with Istio, uh, it's it's comparable. So that's our first deployment, right? So we have uh, a traffic generator, so that's gonna uh, send traffic uh, in uh, in uh, over a certain amount of time, and then uh, we're gonna not send traffic for a while, and then send traffic again to kind of mimic, you know, fluctuating uh, traffic. And so you can see here our deployment one with our pods with the Istio proxy inside, so with the side container. And then uh, we're collecting the metrics from, uh, from Kepler, and then we're going to see how that behaves. And then our second deployment, of course, is the serverless deployment, um, where it's a similar setup, right? So we're going to generate some traffic, send it to our uh, pods, and they're going to scale up uh, when the traffic comes in, thanks to Knative. And then uh, we stop the traffic, and then it's going to scale down to zero. And so let's see what happened. Mm -hmm. So we we had this couple of deployments and we just need a setup that, like to set it all up. So we just created a couple of uh, uh, Kubernetes cron jobs. So uh, just remember we will be sending in namespace one uh, uh, traffic 2,000 requests per second to from the traffic generator to six uh, uh, instances of this very thin uh, mock uh, server, and then we will rest for 10 minutes. Then another 20 minutes to Knative. Knative will be um, uh, scaling, upscaling uh, our deployments up to six. And then there is a concurrency factor that uh, is not very relevant for this, but it's just there. Um, so we just press play. And we, uh, of course, Kepler is watching. I told you, Kepler is always watching. So we uh, build this dashboard based on the data coming from Kepler. So I was very happy because I saw a great difference between uh, energy, and I will explain those. This is, uh, I know I, I'm throwing like a lot of uh, um, colors and things here. But they uh, look really fancy. <laughs> yeah, I love Grafana. <laughs> um, so the, 
what, what, I, what I first found was this, this overlap, but then if you look at the labels, the one that is uh, consuming more energy, so I'm showing now in that red box at the top, um, uh, real-time power consumption in watts, uh, the big one is serverless. <laughs> so I was like very sad. Um, and then the other one is what, the one we call server full. And then we have this uh, amount of energy that we are also seeing uh, at the right. Those are the numbers of the energy consumption over time. And so we, we had this observation. We also observe, if you see there is a small box in the big box that says this is a small overlap, that is something that happens uh, when we are idle, when we are not sending traffic. So we wanted to understand what's there. So there is also this panel telling a breakdown on the different namespaces that are contributing to the serverless experiment. So the big one, which is the red one, is the total, which is the addition of the serverless namespace from, with our experiment, plus the key native um, serving namespace. So we have now these two contributions. And that's the one to blame here, right? Um, so there's something in the background doing the stuff. What happens with the Istio um, part or the server full namespace is that the Istio namespace is not contributing to the overall energy consumption itself. It's contributing inside our server full deployment. That's because we get the, the Istio proxy sidecars, and that's the one doing the load. Um, then we can repeat this one for three hours and for six hours, and it's more or less the same, right? Like, more or less, no, it's the same. So just for you to know that this is not just we took a look for one hour and that's it. It's also remarkable that we can also check the amount of um, uh, the different contributions from Rappel, so if they come from the CPU, from RAM, uh, uh, and so forth, and we didn't find any noticeable uh, uh, contribution or, or difference. Um, so th this is a, a summary of that. So just, OK, we saw that more energy coming from serverless in this case. There is this idle power that got us thinking. So we continued. We jumped into experiment two. We added a third um, deployment, right? Uh, which is just, we called it plain. OK, let's forget about load balancing, about throwing um, uh, requests through six instances. Let's just deploy a server and a client and put it together and see what happens. And no surprises. So now we have, the, uh, we have created a stair, right? If we are plain, not load balancing or anything, we don't spend a lot of power. If we put Istio, then we have a contribution of power like 2.5 times. And actually, everything is inside the uh, pods with the uh, Istio proxy sidecar doing this contribution, which makes sense, right? Because we have our traffic generator plus the Istio sidecar, which is more or less doing the same. And the servers that is doing nothing, they are saying, hey, hello world, 200, back. Cool. OK, so I was starting to get nervous because people, uh, our, our friends from Key Native, were helping. And we were telling them, or our, we were finding out that now. Uh, so, yeah, I got frustrated like that guy, and I started to add more load and more load. So, okay, 4,000 requests per second. I did more experiments like, hey, what if we change this burst limit so we don't bother a lot, key native? What if we, you know, like playing around just, just to let you know that those things didn't work? Uh, so, I, I will not, um, I'm collapsing uh, the, the results here, but the trends are the same, just for you to know. 4,000 rubles per second, the same, uh, going back to 2,000 rubles per second and, um, and changing these parameters, no. So again, I was a bit frustrated and then I called Kevin, like um, I was yeah, not crying, but yeah, we, were, we needed to talk here, right? And, and then Kevin had this, this great idea. Right, yeah, so um, I was telling Jose, okay, so we're trying to send more and more load and we're getting the same results. So, what are we, well, like, what can we do to change the scenario here? And then I was thinking, well, the applications that we're using are, how, you know, a really efficient application. So I was, I was using this uh, Quarkus application. So it's like basically a Java implementation, but I was compiling it down to a native binary. So it was like, you know, really fast. 
uh, and using not very many resources, but for our use case, that actually didn't quite make sense because we were trying to, you know, get some real measurements. So we're like, come on, do something, you know, do something real. Um, and so, yeah, I just like made up this. Uh, you can you can laugh at this, but <laughs> I just uh, basically created this little uh, endpoint where we pass in a, a, a parameter for uh, you need to run for this amount of time and then generate some load, right? So uh, do some calculations, uh, increasingly more and more, and then uh, append to a string. So we also have you know the memory building, and uh, well, it worked surprisingly well, right? I mean, so we actually did all of a sudden create a whole bunch of uh, load on our system. Yeah, and actually, this was doing some, like, a lot of stuff, like what happens with an efficient code that is, like, filling a lot of strings, right, and, uh, and all of that, that we couldn't uh, load the system with, like, 2,000 requests per second, 4,000 requests per second, because all the, the pods were having, like, the, yeah, I mean. Uh, so in this example, which I think is, it was good, we came to six requests per second, but now our uh, servers are doing stuff. And what we found now is that a case in which actually when we compare uh, a use case with uh, server full and serverless, right, Istio versus Kinative, which by the way you can combine, but just we want to try to understand what's going on, then we get more or less the same numbers. And this was exciting because then we got to understand that it really depends on what you are measuring, what your workloads are doing, what they are doing when they are running, what they are doing when they are idle. And then with that information, then you can take actions, right? And also in this use case, the main contribution that we had for the serverless um, uh, use case, it's only coming from our serverless namespace with our experiment. It's not coming from all the other serverless namespaces uh, like uh, key native serving, which was the one that was contributing too much er energy or power in this case to our uh, uh, experiment. So we actually um, found some situations in which it can help. And we will tell you why. Actually, coming back to our question, we are close to wrap up. Is serverless powerfully powerless or not? Right. And so the answer, as always in IT, is it depends, right? <laughs> um, I mean, on the one hand, we could see that if we have very small workloads and uh, limited uh, amount of, uh, of uh, workloads that are running, it probably you're not going to get much gain from scaling down to zero, right? And especially if our pods that are running um, aren't doing much uh, if they are not getting the request in, like just like with uh, serverless where they scale down to zero. Uh, if they're not getting any requests, we found that uh, those pods really are not consuming much energy. So that's you know one interesting outcome from uh, from our experimentation. Um, but on the other hand, we could also see that you know in certain use cases, serverless definitely did uh, save some power, um, and then. Well, what we didn't measure is, you know, like what if uh, we actually have different kinds of density in our uh, nodes, right? So, on the one hand, if uh, if we don't use serverless, we have to schedule a certain amount of provisioning. Uh, even if we can auto scale with Kubernetes, we still need to over provision. So, let's say these are representations of nodes, and on the left side, you see this is kind of a non-serverless. Uh, node where we need to um, over provision, and then on the right side you see that we can actually have uh, use our resources more efficiently on this one node. So when requests are not happening, we unschedule some loads, and then if some requests are coming in, uh, you know it kind of fluctuates a lot uh, faster and better. So that at the end of the day, we can use our more our nodes more efficiently and potentially use less nodes. And I don't think we really need to measure with Kepler uh, the difference between a node that's up and running versus a node that's shut off, right? I mean, even in the cloud, you could say, well, the cloud providers, they still have those nodes you know, uh, running for, uh, for other workloads or something. But it's kind of like uh, the less power we use, the less power they need to provision, right? So we definitely can save uh, energy by using these uh, kinds of uh, serverless scheduling. Yeah, so uh, actually, that's, 
that's the whole point about this talk. The important thing is about measure. We can now measure these things. And for those challenges that Kevin was sharing at the beginning of this talk, which were about over-provisioning, then you can measure, do I need that or not? Then you can measure what's the overhead of serverless, what's the overhead of Istio, whatever you have in the background, and then understand the price it has. Every time you add something that is doing stuff, it has a price. Um, there are also a constant uh, uh, contribution to these energies uh, that are also important. So don't only measure when you are running traffic under load, also take into account those things, because they don't scale uh, linearly. Right? We found out that the contribution to the energy um, uh, from in our namespace was more or less the same for, for six uh, requests per second and for 4,000 requests per second in terms of traffic, right? So really, it depends on what you are seeing or, or what your workload is doing. And so there's one size does not fit all. And again, if, you only, if, if I were to tell you to take away from here is measure and provision accordingly. And maybe a third one, because um, this is something I'm always thinking and I miss uh, from my programming days. Um, now you have this superpower. Um, whenever you have a, a pull request, you are reviewing code, uh, you were looking, hey, I'm more a space guy, or I'm more like a tab guy, and then you, you will get a, uh, your, your pull request rejected. Now you can actually measure if that one is efficient or not, and so uh, your, your colleague um, to how dare you, right? Um, so uh, c coming back uh, to future work. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think we're still experimenting. It's a really interesting project. So I think we're going to continue trying with different services, uh, maybe trying with different topologies, uh, maybe add, you know, scaling nodes with uh, machine auto scaling and seeing, you know, like, I mean, again, we can assume that turning a node off is going to save you energy, but maybe we should measure it too. I don't know. Uh, and then uh, seeing what the relationship, what the actual relationship is between um, the requests that we're sending in uh, and then the work that the application actually is doing. So uh, I think we can continue with some work and uh, uh, I think yeah. we, 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 we will continue with that. Yeah, that's very important. We will continue uh, with the backup of these great people that uh, we really want to shout out. Uh, um, Vibu was helping me a lot, so Vibu, thank you very much. Um, uh, Sunil, Vimal, Kai, Huamin, uh, Paru, Marcelo, everyone uh, that is contributing to this great project. Uh, I saw a lot of, uh, I didn't see a lot of hands here knowing about Kepler, please pass by their booth. They are very nice people. This is a great uh, uh, project, uh, so Please go there. And also Keynative, right? They were helping us a lot. Yeah, and they have a booth here too. So uh, and uh, thanks to Roland, who's, who has a talk at the same time. So we, we asked him to come to this talk, but he couldn't. Jerk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, thank you for, for joining. So uh, please, uh, we would love your feedback. So if you go to the sked uh, of this talk, you can leave the feedback. You can also find the slides for this talk. Um, and then uh, repository is uh, right there, too. And um, I'll give you just a second to, to take a scan, because I, I hate when uh, somebody shows a QR code and then skips to the next slide. It's like, wait. Uh, but you, if you uh, registered for this, uh, for this talk, you can also just uh, access the slides uh, there. And then uh, just a quick shout out to, uh, to our friendly employer, uh, Red Hat. But uh, they actually sponsor some of our books and then uh, make them available uh, for free to download. So uh, if you're interested, we have a whole bunch of uh, different books available uh, that you can download. And again, we will share the slides, so they'll be in there as well. And then uh, one particular uh, note of interest for me personally, uh, so I, we're uh, working on this uh, serverless Java in action book. Uh, so if you're um, a Java fan and you like serverless, then uh, take you know keep an eye out for this. It's coming soon. And uh, I think I saw Daniel here in the room, my co-author. But uh, yeah. And with that, thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know um, either you know through all these channels or here in the room because I think we still have uh, a minute we or two. We have five minutes. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much.
if you have any questions, you can walk up to one of the microphones, I think, so don't be shy. Or you can also be shy, and then we can talk afterwards. We'll be at the, at the Red Hat booth, I think, afterwards yep. for, for questions. And if you want to see, uh, a, a, I think you can probably show us, uh, show at the demo, uh, Kep or at the Red Hat booth, how Kepler works, right? Uh, quick. Yeah, I think so. Out of the pocket demo. Yeah. yeah, 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 I can do that. OK, we have a question. Thank you. Um, my question is, did you ever check out if C states, like uh, we all know that a lot of hardware just has deep C states disabled for dubious reasons, did you ever check out how much of an impact that enabling that actually makes in a whole fleet of thousands and billions and trillions and nodes? Uh, we didn't check that, not at all, but uh, noted, and uh, we, we, we want to take a look at more stuff, so that's good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, you can add it as an issue to the repository. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good one. Come on, don't be shy. Okay. Okay. Going once. Going twice. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>